Today is the first Sunday in Lent. Lent began this past Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday, as we reminded each other of our mortality, that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We reminded each other that we come humbly before God, trusting in something beyond death. We started our journey with Jesus towards the cross. Throughout the next seven weeks, we are going to explore the I am statements from Jesus found in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. If you want to delve deeper into these statements beyond just the sermon series, if you want your extra credit, the insert in your bulletin this morning has daily words to meditate upon and a website where you can find a daily devotion and scripture. It is important, I think, to look at these statements and Lent is a good time to do so. As we enter into this season of repentance and of reflection, we can use these statements to get a better understanding of who Jesus was. There is no single word that can fully describe Jesus, and so it takes a variety of terminology to give us an idea of who he was and who God is. Throughout his gospel, John describes Jesus using varying terminology. From the very first verse, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. While incredibly deep and meaningful, (laughs) this understanding of Jesus as the Word takes effort to unpack. It is complicated and uncommon. The I am statements from Jesus, however, use symbols familiar to the people in his time. The community understood these common symbols of bread, shepherd, gate, and vine. While there is much to say about each of them, they are easily accessible in many levels. As Gail O'Day writes, through these common symbols, Jesus declares that the people's religious needs and human longings are met in him. They suggest that no one title or tradition can contain the totality of Jesus' identity. And so today, we begin with the first description Jesus gives himself. I am the bread of life. A little background knowledge is helpful as usual, as the first verse in our passage provides little description of the setting. So they said to him, who are they? They are a group of people who, as we read in the first part of chapter 6, have been following Jesus around the Sea of Galilee. In John 6, 2, we hear that this large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. They saw him feed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. They saw him calm the sea, and yet still they ask for more. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? They are telling Jesus that they still haven't seen enough to believe in him. They won't follow him yet because they need more proof. O'Day writes that the crowd's request for a sign from Jesus is jarring How can they make such a request immediately after the feeding miracle? Jesus, in their eyes, 
has perhaps become more of a magician than the one to bring God's kingdom on earth. N.T. Wright tells a story of a historian who was working on his Ph.D. In order to finish his thesis, he needed to consider a few paintings, the history that surrounded them, and the influence of the artists. And so he went to the art museum. He walked around room to room, scribbling in his notebook, writing down the names and the dates of the artists and the other information on the printed notices by the paintings. He finished his PhD, but at no time in all of the art galleries had he ever stood back and looked at the paintings themselves and allowed them to speak in their own language. Just as a sign next to a masterpiece in an art museum, is intended to lead our eye to the painting, the signs that Jesus performed were to lead people to God. But the crowds weren't paying attention. They were so focused on the signs themselves that they didn't see the big picture. They didn't allow the signs to lead them to a knowledge and an understanding of Jesus and God. So they asked for more. They reminded Jesus of the story of their ancestors who had received manna in the wilderness, bread from heaven, given when they were wandering with Moses in the desert. Jesus responds to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. O'Day points out that Jesus rewords four essential elements of the people's comment. He tells them that it was not a miracle performed by a person, by Moses. It was a gift from God. It is my Father who gives you the true bread. He moves the gift of bread from their ancestors to the present. It is my Father who gives you the bread the true bread. It is no longer manna that is provided, but Jesus points out that they are now being given true bread in him. And finally, he once again points out that they are the recipients, not their ancestors. It is my Father who gives you the true bread. The crowd has been asking for a sign. And Jesus shows them that they have already received it in him. I am the bread of life. Think for a moment about bread. Think about the smell of freshly baked bread. Think about the taste of warm bread right out of the oven. It is such a simple image, a common symbol, yet it stirs in each of us a vivid thought. This is the reason that bread is found throughout religious life. We use it every time we say the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. We taste it each time we take communion, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. We see it throughout scripture. Psalm 78 says he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Just a few verses after our passage today, John writes, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. And the bread which I give is my flesh given for the life of the world. It is bread and fish that filled the people when Jesus multiplied the loaves and fish to feed the 5,000. Bread is something that people understand. In those days, it was an essential and major part of their diet. 
Without their daily portion, they would be hungry. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we are asking, literally, for enough bread to eat. Jesus is concerned with our spiritual well-being, but he also cares for our health and our physical well-being. The Gospels are full of examples of Jesus caring for the sick and the hungry. He realizes that the body as well as the soul has to be fed. Bread is such a simple image. With just four ingredients, flour, yeast, salt, and water, something new is created, something that is filling. Flour, the simple grain that provides the basis for the bread, something that on its own tastes bland and unappetizing. Yeast, the tiny ingredient that allows the bread to take new form, that allows the bread to rise. Salt, which provides flavor, transforming the other ingredients into something that tastes good and enhances the other ingredients. The mineral that is used for preserving food and keeping the electrolytes in our bodies balanced. And the last ingredient, water. The one thing that is required for all living things. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus who rose like the yeast, who provides sustenance like the flour, who is good and transforming like the salt, and who is life-giving like the water. Jesus is the bread of life. Rob Fouquet has written about these I am statements, and he writes that the crowd is fewer than 24 hours removed from a miracle, and they are asking, what can you do for us now? Jesus is offering satisfaction, but the people are chasing fullness. What is the difference between fullness and satisfaction? Consider for a moment this idea of fullness. Our world is full of many things. It is full of noise. We sit in a busy restaurant and there isn't a moment's silence. We have the TV or the radio going constantly in the background whether or not we are actually paying attention to it. Our world is full of communications. We rarely leave our cell phones, and we check emails and Facebook on a regular basis. Our world is full of stuff. Our homes have so many things in them, many of which we don't need or perhaps even want. None of these things are bad in themselves, but they are things that fill our lives. Our worlds are full, but are we satisfied? Fouquet writes that someone asked J.D. Rockefeller how much money was enough, and he responded, just a little bit more. The crowds want just a little bit more. They want one more sign, one more miracle to prove again who Jesus really is. They are seeking fullness, but they don't see the satisfaction, the lasting completeness that Jesus offers. Jesus says to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Regular bread will leave them full, but in the true bread, the bread of life, Jesus is offering satisfaction. He is offering fulfillment in God's grace. It is interesting that Jesus mentions hunger and thirst in this verse. Scholar O'Day writes that this comes from Jewish wisdom traditions, where God's revelation is often represented as Israel's food and drink. 
in Proverbs, a personified wisdom says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Eat, drink, be satisfied and know God. On Ash Wednesday, we repented. We asked God's forgiveness. Joel 2.13 asks us to return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. God has forgiven us. During Lent, we reflect and come back to God. We come to be filled with the bread of life, just as the Israelites were filled with manna, just as the 5,000 were filled with five loaves and two fish. We come to be filled with that which will (coughs) satisfy the bread of life, Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.